Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's be healthy together. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of New Jersey residents and businesses for more than 100 years. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. Tonight on NJTV News, ramping up the pace and the politics in the U.S. Senate race. A historic election. We're on the campaign trail with just two weeks to go before Election Day. Election Day is right around the corner, but what will that mean for students of vocational schools? Plus, with poverty rates declining, why are more families struggling to afford the basics? And we'll show you what lurks in the mold of old housing stock here. Those stories are more next on NJTV News. from the Agnes Varis NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark. This is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us, and please forgive the bandage, the result of necessary but not serious surgery. We begin with the tight and contentious U.S. Senate race between Republican Bob Hugan and Democrat Bob Menendez. Senior correspondent David Cruz has an update. In the final fortnight of the 2018 midterm campaign, Bob Menendez is calling in the markers accumulated over 40 years of elected office. Today it was law enforcement and first responders, represented by their union heads and some rank and file, who gathered in the shadow of the World Trade Center to announce their backing of the state's senior senator. Within four months, Senator Menendez delivered $1.5 million for us to hire 13 more sheriff's officers. And this is the kind of man that we need in Washington. He I think uh, that you all know that I'm not a candidate coming around before Election Day and promising that I'll have your back. I've always had your back. Over in Union County, where Republican Bob Hugan was preparing for a fundraiser tonight, the former drug company CEO waved off the Menendez event this morning. We're lucky to have first responders in this state that put themselves at risk to protect us every day. But I'll tell you, what's wrong with government, it has become transactional as opposed to policy and philosophical and the people's issues. What, what I get from me, what you get from me, and how we trade off, that's, that's what's bad about government. That's what led up to the problems that Senator Menendez had with his best friend, Sal Melgan. It's a disgrace. New Jersey deserves better. It's difficult after months of campaigning to get the candidates to talk about anything other than their default position of highlighting their opponent's faults. Ask the senator what he's feeling in the final days of the toughest fight of his political life, and he will tell you everything he says is wrong with Bob Hugan. The reality is, is that every election is challenging. When I ran the first time, I ran against a storied name, uh, uh, the son of the former governor. And then I ran against someone who was very close to Chris Christie when Chris Christie was popular uh, and got hit by Super Storm Sandy in, you know, less than a week before the campaign. That was challenging. Uh, but what's challenging uh, this time is that we have a multimillionaire who made a killing off of cancer victims. Bob Hugan's company was sued for putting cancer patients in danger. In a campaign that has degenerated into name calling and charge hurling, neither candidate seems particularly inclined to spend a minute of airtime, free or otherwise, not pointing out the negatives of his opponent. You think that after spending $25 million, you'd actually tell people in New Jersey what you're going to be for. $25 million later, uh, my Republican opponent hasn't told New Jerseyans in one commercial what he's actually going to do for them. The other side says, all you've been saying is how terrible uh, your opponent is, and you haven't been saying much about you. Yeah, I, Dave, I really don't, I don't think that's accurate or fair. I think actually he, after 25 years in Washington, 16 years of those time with a Democratic president, his whole camp is campaign is not about what he's done. He doesn't talk about him. He wants to make it a, an election about me or somebody else. Both sides have made much of their campaigns about the other guy in TV ads and campaign literature and public appearances. Wednesday, they'll have their only debate where questions about them will be front and center as this campaign heads into the home stretch. For NJTV News, I'm David Cruz.
As David mentioned, on Wednesday, PBS NewsHour's Lisa Desjardins and our chief political correspondent, Michael Aaron, co-moderate a debate for the U.S. Senate seat. Menendez and Hugan face off at 8. Watch it live, on air, or online. The midterm election ballot won't just list congressional candidates. Voters across New Jersey will decide whether to let the state borrow another half a billion dollars. Leah Mishkin explains what the money would be for. By our estimation, in manufacturing alone, there's over 30,000 open jobs right now. Four students apply for every one seat we have. Expanding vocational schools to meet demand is one of several educational priorities addressed in the Securing Our Children's Future Bond Act. Murphy conditionally vetoed prior legislation for $1 billion, citing concerns about adding to the state's $46 billion in debt, estimating the total debt payments would range between $1.7 billion and $2.2 billion over 30 years, depending on interest and other factors. The current bond up for vote is half that, $350 million for vocational school expansion and school security, $100 million for school water infrastructure, and $50 million to county colleges for career and technical training. While the Murphy administration says the $500 million is sustainable, effective, and in line with the state's long-term fiscal health, the cost and how the money will be divided up is a concern for some. Senator Mike Doherty says taxpayers need to remember they will have to pay the $500 million back. If these are projects that school districts want to complete, you should do this locally where you have to look your neighbors in the eye as you're asking them to pay more taxes to fund these projects. But it's been my experience that this one-size-fits-all from Trenton approach never works out. Many promises are made, but the money always seems to disappear without the projects being done. The measure doesn't explain how school security and vocational school funding will be divided out of that $350 million. Co-sponsor Senator Steve Oraho says that will all be decided by the Department of Education. Do you not think that the voters have a right, if they approve $500 million, sure. to know the specifics before voting yes or no? Quite frankly, broadly, it is, you know, obviously they got to be used for school security or vocational, ed or vocational education or, you know, water uh, safety, it's, it's, it's got to be in those buckets. So the issue of actual projects and whatnot, they're still going to be pretty far down the line, uh, you know, for, you know, could be a year, two years, or three years. So why not put this on the ballot in a few years when we know the specifics? Yeah, but the issue of the school security is we know we need to make our schools safer today. Oraho says this legislation came in response to the Parkland school shooting in which 17 people were killed. As for money for water infrastructure, schools could use that to address lead, which has been found in the water in several schools in New Jersey. The last time a public question was put to voters on educational spending was 2012, when voters approved $750 million in matching grants for capital upgrades to state colleges. The Constitution does require that new debts are approved by voters. Well, we think over time this um, investment is actually going to pay for itself with a stronger economy and um, more people working in better jobs, earning higher salaries, paying more taxes. Whether you agree is up to you to decide when you go to the polls. Leah Mishkin, NJTV News. Medical marijuana numbers top tonight's business news. Here with the details of that and more is Rhonda Schaffler. Rhonda? Mary Alice, the number of patients participating in New Jersey's medicinal marijuana program has doubled since the start of this year. The State Department of Health says there are now 34,000 patients in the program, which has added 300 doctors for a total number of 800 participating physicians. The state says it's reduced in half the amount of time it takes patients to get ID cards. It's now typically about two weeks. The state currently has six dispensaries and is reviewing operator applications for an additional six. Meantime, word from the federal government that its online Affordable Care Act exchange, known as healthcare.gov, was breached last week. The government says about 75,000 consumer files were breached. It's apparently not clear what kind of information was accessed. It's also not known at this time if that breach affected any New Jersey residents. 
The state has rejected an application for a massive housing development in the Pinelands. The Department of Environmental Protection declined to issue a permit needed by Hofsons, which wants to build 4,000 housing units on the site in Manchester Township, Ocean County. The DEP stated the application failed to address several issues, including stormwater management, air quality, traffic impact, and protection of certain threatened species. The company says it will appeal this decision. Governor Murphy continues his overseas journey to strengthen economic ties between New Jersey and other nations. The state has signed an agreement with the Israel Innovation Authority, which seeks to attract business and investments into New Jersey's so-called innovation economy. The governor says the state's existing relationship with Israel already amounts to about a billion dollars a year in shared economic activity, which could increase under this agreement. One example of that, the Israeli pharmaceutical company Teva recently agreed to set up its North American headquarters in Parsippany, Troy Hills. On Wall Street, the Dow tumbled 127 points. The rest of the market closed mixed. And those are your top business stories. Support for the Medical Report is provided by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. With the Murphy administration still rocked by allegations a senior staffer raped a woman during the governor's campaign last year, Murphy's called in former state attorney general Chris Perino, who first came on as chief counsel to Governor Christie just as the Bridgegate scandal broke. In addition to investigations launched by the state Senate and Assembly, Governor Murphy's launched an independent investigation of how staffers handled Katie Brennan's allegations she was sexually assaulted by Albert Alvarez. The Middlesex County Prosecutor's Office is also reviewing how the case was handled. The bill that would legalize recreational marijuana is still a work in progress, and now there's a push to have it written in a way that gives women, minorities, and people in underprivileged communities a hand in the growing business. Michael Hill reports. Senate Bill 2703 to legalize adult recreational marijuana use was speeding toward a vote next Monday, but reality, lack of support, negotiation over amendments, has sent that plan up in smoke. We're doing a couple of things. There's a seismic shift in public policy and the creation of a new industry. That's when you really do want to get right. So the, we, I think the goal has always been to do just that, to make sure we get it right. Uh, and if that takes a little more time than we had anticipated, uh, so be it. Among the talks underway, how to address the blacks and browns disproportionately arrested, prosecuted, and incarcerated for marijuana, and how to make sure adult legalization adequately includes them for licensing to make a profit from what would become legal. Social equity is designed really to make sure that there is an even playing field, if you will. Um, it, 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 it's designed really to assist those in having some opportunity in this industry that they didn't have in the past and may not have unless the social equity component is in place. Hunt, Hamlin, and Ridley wrote what it calls a race and gender neutral social equity, not diversity, amendment for the bill on behalf of the New Jersey Minority Alliance, a clause that would grant access to licenses based on the economics of traditionally underserved communities. There may be other folks that have been affected um, that doesn't necessarily include the individuals when we talk about diversity. Veterans, I think, are a part of diversity, which is great, and there's nothing that is negative as it relates to that, but not all veterans have been affected by the failed war on drugs. Not all women have been affected by the failed war on drugs, and you may have some people who live in certain areas who have been affected by the failed war on drugs. One lawmaker involved in the negotiations of the adult legalization bill says the talks are going well and that the bill includes both diversity language and social equity. I think the negotiations are going very well. There is a, a, a lot of support and, and like-minded individuals who definitely do want to see that segment of the population made whole through this. And uh, our speaker has been you know, leading negotiations, and he's been very inclusive in thought. But Senator Ron Rice says regardless of what you call it, it amounts to a set-aside and won't stand up if challenged in court. If we're going to argue economic justice on marijuana, go get, or cannabis, a, piece of the go get a piece of what's legal now. And you, you're fighting for something in the future. By the time you realize that we may not even have legalization of recreational marijuana, 
all the economic justice and the money being paid out is going to be gone. Rice favors decriminalization instead of adult legalization. He's calling on the nonpartisan state office of legislative services to follow another law and prepare a racial impact statement of the adult legalization bill. Michael Hill, NJTV News. Teaching an environmental lesson, that tops tonight's Garden State Express. Our first stop, Moorestown, where William Allen Middle School art teacher Julia Mooney has been donning the same gray dress since the school year started and will do it for 100 days to teach her students about eco-sustainability, image, and social acceptance. Her One Outfit 100 Day campaigns caught on with her husband, some teachers, and a second grader. Ms. Mooney protects it with an apron in class and hand washes it at home and has a spare just in case and plans to keep it up until sometime in February. Next to Secaucus, where the construction of a single 20-story high utility pole is something to celebrate, the Gateway Development Corporation calls it a key part of the Gateway Project. Eventually, monopoles will carry transmission lines supplying power to all Northeast Corridor trains to and from New York. Planting this pole is a critical part of the early construction work on the Portal North Bridge project of the Gateway Program. Progress. Finally, Vineland, resurrecting the fabled Palace of Depression, made famous by a 1940s short film called The Fantastic Castle. It was built in 1929 of clay and scrap and old machine parts, much of it torn down in 1969. In the 1990s, Vineland's licensing and inspection director, Kevin Kirshner, was faced with demolishing the remains. Instead, now retired, he's president of the Palace of Depression Restoration Association, leading the effort to recreate the House of Junk to mimic the original, old statues and car parts and bottles, and even a fake eyeball to boot. Trick or treat? And that's the Garden State Express for Monday, October 22nd. Something up in your neighborhood? Tip us off. New Jersey's poverty rate may have dipped down slightly, but the number of households that can't afford basic necessities rose between 2010 and 2016 by 15 percent because costs rose higher than wages. Brianna Venosi has the latest Alice report on the state's working poor who are still chasing the dream. Yeah, that could go like that. It fits. Despite 20 years as a full-time child care worker, Jamie, she's asked us not to use her last name, struggles to make a living in New Jersey. Her story's not unlike more than a third of households here, where residents can't make ends meet. Even with a post-recession recovery, Jamie's considered part of a growing population called Alice, asset limited, income constrained, employed. The economy is doing well, and yet the Alice um, measures and, and budgets show that it's not reaching everybody. The number of households struggling to afford basic needs grew by 15 percent between 2010 and 2016, according to the United Way Alice report released today. It shows that in 2016, 1.2 million, or 38 and a half percent of New Jersey households live in poverty or fit the definition of working poor. Alice faces huge problems in terms of um, housing, uh, affordable housing availability, child care uh, availability, especially quality child care. And as we know, health care is a challenge everywhere. Alice households hit both the young and old, all races and ethnicities, especially households headed by a recent immigrant. And those with low skills or a disability are also vulnerable. I think most concerning to everybody is that people working in their prime years, 25 to 64 years old, 
are Alice and poverty. New Jersey's always been a high cost of living state, but the numbers are grim. In 2016, costs for basic needs outpaced both the rate of wage growth and inflation, rising 16 percent, according to the Alice report, meaning a single adult needed a household survival budget of $24,300 to get by. But a family of four with two young kids in daycare needed around $75,000 a year for the bare minimum with no savings. What's the solution? The simple solution is to raise people's incomes, something that we can do immediately by moving on raising the minimum wage, which all houses and the governor have expressed support for. The governor did vow to make inroads, acknowledging the report in a statement today, saying we must make this a legislative priority and work to enact it before the end of the upcoming holidays. Economic stability would be among the best holiday gifts we could possibly give our Alice families. The report's author says there's a lot more that needs to be addressed for New Jersey's cost of living other than the minimum wage, but it's certainly a start. For NJTV News, I'm Brianna Venosi. Many families who live in older homes, including affordable housing, must sometimes deal with other daunting challenges, the lead and mold still embedded in the walls. Raven Santana reports. If your home was built before 1978, there's a good chance it has lead-based paint, according to the EPA. New Jersey has 11 communities that had higher um, uh, incidents of children having high leads um, uh, compared to Flint in the same year. And what we know is that the most likely place to uh, be poisoned by lead is not necessarily by water, it's from old paint in housing. Senior director of a community-based health organization, Elise Pivnik, was one of a handful of speakers at a public hearing by the Assembly Housing and Development Committee. The discussion focused on how mold and lead impacts affordable housing in our state. Currently, there are laws requiring lead testing for homes built before 1978, but no laws requiring lead inspections for single or two-family homes built during or after 1978, leaving tenants to fend for themselves. Certainly, people are afraid to lose their housing. There's not enough affordable housing in New Jersey, and that's a problem nationwide. A person can be poisoned by eating lead or breathing in lead dust. In older homes, lead paint is most likely to chip or peel off where children can easily eat it. Experts say it can cost an average of $20,000 to remove lead paint. Despite our state having laws to protect tenants against household hazards like lead paint, our state does not have any laws or standards to regulate mold. In the state of New Jersey, there is no certification for people performing uh, mold inspection. There are remediation guidelines, but there are no laws. Monmouth County Health Officer Chris Merkel says that there aren't enough laws regarding mold because reactions can be variable. Basically because it's so hard for each person's different in terms of their reactions to mold. Some people may uh, get symptoms at low levels of mold versus somebody who doesn't get symptoms versus high levels of mold. It's very important that no matter what kind of rules we set for, enforcement is huge. Who's responsible? Who's going to follow up? And who's going to report back that this is working? Advocates say besides enforcement, Finding a place to relocate tenants when lead or mold is found can be a huge challenge since affordable housing is usually located in older buildings where the same issue can arise. In Camden, Raven Santana and JTV News. Support for the Environment Report provided by PSENG, making things more sustainable for New Jersey. Some noteworthy facts that help you know Jersey. There are some 3.2 million households in New Jersey. New Jersey realtors say it costs about $15 a square foot to remediate a home contaminated with lead paint. Between 1995 and 2017, voters approved about 91 percent of statewide ballot measures, and the New Jersey Department of Health says about 100 new medical marijuana patients are registered every day. 
If there's someone who you'd like to get to know Jersey, share use hashtag no Jersey. Tomorrow on NJTV News, local representatives take on the IRS over those caps on state and local tax deductions. And Wednesday, Democratic Senator Bob Menendez and his Republican challenger Bob Hugan square off right here in the next of our weekly debates ahead of the midterm elections. You can join the debate on air or online starting at 8. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. The members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. And PSE&G, we make things work for communities. Funding for Chasing the Dream is provided by the JPB Foundation and the Ford Foundation. NJM Insurance Company has been serving New Jersey policyholders for more than 100 years. But just who are NJM's policyholders? They're the social service and nonprofit pioneers who lend a helping hand. Science and technology innovators. The men and women who provide our skilled labor. And our homegrown champions. The people who make our state a great place to call home. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered. I'm fighting cancer. I'm fighting cancer. I am fighting cancer. I fight every day. Every night. Every hour, every minute, and every, every second. second. RWJ Barnabas Health, together with the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey, brings the latest research, treatments, and clinical trials close to home. We're fighting cancer. And I'm not fighting alone. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's beat cancer together.